Well, good morning, everybody. The storms yesterday across parts of the Midwest and Plains were, uh, were rather rough. We saw uh, nearly 350, I think over 350 reports of severe weather. And I just want to kind of talk about the storms that I was closest to just to get us started here. I got to tip my cap to the American Airlines pilot. Uh, we left a little bit of late out of Chicago and had to fly to Omaha. And that pilot came in um, pretty low and pretty fast because we were attempting to beat this squall line that was heading uh, right here um, along I-80, uh, but spreading north and south and uh, coming straight toward Omaha with 80 to 100 mile an hour winds. Now this was a very tight but Boeing segment of the storm. There was a lot of damage done in Omaha last night and surrounding areas. You'll see in the storm reports in a few moments, but um, trees uh, knocked over all over the place. I tried to get good pictures as I came in on the airplane, but just it was hard to get pictures out of the airplane window. And then, um, and then when we landed, we were all locked into the airport for about 45 minutes under tornado warnings. Um, I was very surprised, and this is just a commentary on, on what to do. The, the straight line winds, not tornadic winds, but the straight line winds in this were quite fierce. In fact, let's go look at this. I'm going to flip this over to velocity. So now we're going to be using the, the Doppler capability of the radar here. And I want to take you back. Oh, I got to click play first. Let's get those all loaded. Sorry, I'm on uh, my cell phone uh, uh, internet connection this morning. The hotel doesn't have Wi-Fi. A lot of power issues uh, here. But this is what I want to show you. Um, as this storm came through, uh, if we just take a look using this tool over here, we can see where the uh, what the wind speeds look like. Now remember, this is um, not at the surface. This is actually 800 feet above the surface. And um, I can tell all of that by looking right up here. So you'll notice wherever I hover, you can get the value, like the elevation angle, the lat long, and then the, the feet. See it up there? It kind of goes away when I go off the screen, but whatever. So this is still pretty low in the atmosphere, but we had you know, uh, just a few hundred feet above the surface, 90 to 100 mile an hour wind gusts that were coming through and did a lot of damage. Now, my commentary was that at the airport, um, I had several people that were quite wise and they went to the middle of the airport because the shelters were all full in the airport at Omaha. Uh, but the number of people that walked over to the windows was very surprising to me and just stood by the windows and tried to watch this. That is, that's, the, that's not the thing that you want to do when strong winds like this came through. But again, this is using the velocity data here. And apparently there were a couple of small spin-ups in this. Uh, the National Weather Service prompted um, tornado warnings because of that. And uh, it was really quite uh, rough uh, in terms of the uh, severe winds we saw that night. Uh, from here, though, I want to kind of give you a, a bigger picture of this. So let's just play this going forward. This is the storm complex. Just kind of pause it right there. Outstanding view on radar of the outflow to the south of this getting into Kansas. And yes, some of these storms did get through parts of Kansas, which you know is a state that I've been very concerned about getting storms through to, to deliver some rainfall while they're dealing with this heat. They kind of made it all the way to the southeast corner, although they were fizzling out as they made it down there pretty far, and that maybe limited some rainfall. But this storm complex, um, which again began right here in central Nebraska, did make it through Iowa, Missouri, over to Illinois even this morning. Uh, that's where it's ended up. So it's almost off the image here as I let it go right to the uh, early morning hours. But just to show you this, in fact, let's blow this up a little bit. This is from poweroutage.us. Um, Nebraska is still tracking about 178,000 power uh, customers without power. You can kind of zoom in here if you ever use this site and kind of see some of these counties. So I'm in Douglas County now, uh, 127,000 people without power. And again, I think it's affecting the internet. So hope, I apologize if this is a bit slow uh, to upload this morning. My phone, uh, thankfully, I still have some data left on it. Okay, remember that was just one uh, of a, a system of large storms. And as we let this uh, satellite animation play through last night, take a look at parts of South Dakota and Minnesota, huge hail uh, in, in this area. We had some deeper convection in the southeast and also in the southwest and a lot of wildfire smoke, including that fire that's near Loveland, Colorado that continues to burn. And then you see throughout the west as the sun was setting, just again, the, the widespread wildfire issues going on there. I did want to bring up some infrared data. I don't often show this. Um, I should. It's just sometimes I really like the crisp view of those visible images. But uh, this just shows you the overall system uh, leading up to early this morning. And when you look at the infrared, uh, we color code this in these deeper shades that get darker and darker into the reds and almost black. But that actually indicates cold. That indicates very cold cloud tops. And the, the darker those shades become here, um, basically the more intense those storms are. And so they were certainly ripping through the Midwest yesterday and continue uh, into the eastern Corn Belt early this morning. So 
I imagine my, my family over here in Champaign has been uh, woken up early due to some strong storm and probably a lot of lightning early. But I want to show you these storm reports. 360, that's where we're up to now. And a couple of tornadoes, uh, one in Cass County, another one in Pottawatomie County in Iowa. Uh, but if you come down a little bit farther, I want to show you the hail that's to the north here. I just found this kind of interesting. But if you slide down here, there was a couple of places uh, like where there's four inch hail that was reported. And just ironically, the name of the county is Big Stone County. So they certainly um, lived up to their name with respect to hail uh, out of this past system. When I use the mesh data uh, to kind of analyze where that hail was, you can see that over the last three days, we've kind of hit this corridor multiple times with uh, some damaging hail. And so this hit some prime acres in the Corn Belt uh, with some uh, significant severe weather. And we just kind of zoom in here a bit on Minnesota. We can take a look at some of the, the event that was last night delivering some of that hail. Okay, let's put it all together in some precip maps. This is the last 72 hours. In fact, I think it just turned 6 a.m., so I should have a new map. There it is. This is uh, through 6 a.m. this morning, and we're just watching where that heavy rainfall kind of slid through that corridor, you know, starting here in the northern plains and finishing in the southeast. We had a low that came into the northwest, delivering a little bit of rain, some southwestern monsoonal moisture, and you can see some of the heavier rains that have made it into the northeast. If I put on uh, the four days before that, so this goes up to a seven-day forecast, or excuse me, a seven-day uh, look back. That's our last week's worth of precip. Uh, tomorrow and Friday when I get home, I'll do kind of a, just kind of a recap of July on the whole. So we'll look at some precip stats for that, but this is just the last week here of July in terms of total precipitation. I should get a new drop monitor, uh, gosh, in about an hour and a half, and it'll be interesting to see how much you know, that rainfall uh, improved the drought situation in certain key areas that have been getting deeper into drought. But this is where we're going with this forecast. Um, if there's an area that I'm concerned about continuing to get just hotter and drier that's east of the Rocky Mountains, it's this region and through here. Um, as we set up this deeper trough, especially into next week, that'll live over the Hudson Bay, it's going to just drag and leave a frontal boundary in this area. And then we are going to watch the Bermuda High continue to do its thing. Now here is the big wild card. All week long, I've been just showing you how there's been model discrepancies between our two big models, like the GFS and the European, on the placement of this tropical system that's not even developed yet. And uh, the concern is that it will possibly push toward Florida and maybe get into the Gulf of Mexico. I should have been um, maybe a little bit more, I don't know what the right word is here, but maybe given more credit to the GFS initially. Remember, it was the GFS that nailed barrel. The European model took it into Mexico, GFS brought it north into Texas. And so the GFS has been the model that's taken this over Florida and putting it into the Gulf. Now, I just wanna make sure I say that because we're gonna look at those models again in a few moments. But the heat that's gonna likely stay across the southern tier of the US from Texas over to the Delta and the risk of going over much drier here is key, which is why we're gonna to have to watch the GFS very carefully because this is the European run, but the GFS is attempting to take whatever you know this next system becomes it could be named uh, Debbie you know something like this and I want to watch for that very carefully meanwhile the West is going to go back over quite hot uh, especially in the Pacific Northwest going forward and this will lead all the way up into British Columbia as well okay so here is this tropical system this morning in fact they should be updating this very soon oh good they did there's a 737 update and they they uh, they changed, yes, they kind of pushed this a bit even farther to the west. They've got it at a 60% chance of developing. And uh, this system, by the way, just to be very clear, this is it. This is, we're all, we're still living in model land on knowing what this cluster of tropical thunderstorms is going to do. So I want to be very clear that there's uncertainty that this thing develops at all. There will be moisture that's pushed in this area, but does it develop into a tropical storm or possibly a hurricane? We know the ocean temperatures are prime for that but evidence as to how quickly this will develop is still yet to be seen. If we look at a suite of different models, this is the big transition. The European model, looking at tropical cyclone low pressure development, has now taken this and shifted it much farther uh, to the west. Now, you know all week long, what have we said? Well, the Europeans keeping it way out here. I mentioned the timing of troughs, the, where the Bermuda High was gonna be, the saddle point where we talked about that. That narrative's out. Things have shifted around enough to start to give better evidence that this is likely going to move somewhere over Florida, but possibly if it stays over Cuba, get into this part 
of the Gulf of Mexico. So uh, let's do the model comparison again. This has been kind of fun for me. I hope you've enjoyed it as well. I'll start with the European. Uh, so if we slide up here, we'll get a good look at this. All right. So playing through Wednesday into Thursday, fr sorry, the, the initialization was last night. So this is through Thursday into Friday. I mean, this, this is a very weak wave right now in the European. It's right there. That's it. That's what we're keeping an eye on. And then as we go into Saturday and Sunday, this is where the European model, see this right here? That's all we're looking at. That is where the European model is possibly pushing this short wave in this tropical short wave, in this flow that could start to spin up something, you know, right in through here. So what a difference a model run makes. If I were to show you previous runs, this had a low developing right in through here, as you saw, but now we've kind of got this different view of it next Tuesday, Wednesday, and where is it? By next Tuesday, midday, that's where the tropical low pressure center could be according to the newest European run. And as we play it forward, it seems to sit there and spin outside of the kind of more dominant flow of the Bermuda high or the trough that's developing way up to the north. And it might just stay there for a little while, all the way to like the 8th, 9th, and 10th, and just sit and spin. Now, that's the European solution, which has been the one that's kind of changed the most going more toward the GFS solution. And here's the new GFS solution. Now, even though the 6Z run is out, I'm gonna show you the 0Z run. And if we just watch this going forward, that's the wave right there. Where are we? This is Saturday morning. There we are by uh, Sunday night, early Monday morning. And playing through the day on Monday into Tuesday, see how it's got a much deeper low that's sitting um, somewhere near the Florida Panhandle by Tuesday. And I think we have to be giving the GFS more credit for this, uh, especially given that the European models trended more toward this solution. Now, the GFS has got a deeper low boat. What have we been talking about for the last several weeks is how easily the ocean temperatures could support rapid development here if the shear, the wind shear is lower, if the air is, is got a good humidity profile to support this, but it's looking pretty good here in the GFS. Now, where is it by next Wednesday morning, getting into Thursday morning and Friday morning, you know, seven or eight days from now? This is where the GFS solution is quite intriguing. Because I just told you that based off of some bigger picture things, my concern is about the drought and heat that will be developing in this year, this flash drought and heat scenario. If the GFS has got this right, it is the wild card we've been watching and could possibly push whatever this is into the Mississippi Valley. And if the GFS continues, if we just give it credit, that pushes all that moisture clear up into the Ohio River Valley as well and the mid-Mississippi. So this is, uh, is going to be something to watch very carefully. Now, take a look at this. Now, you've, I've shown you these all week long. I'm kind of excited about this. It's just kind of fun to see these transitions. Look at the new European ensemble putting down the probability of tropical depression formation. If you go back even to yesterday's video, it had all of this over here. And now with some new information, it's pushed it all into this part of the Gulf of Mexico. So this is, um, is going to be an important piece. Now, I've not talked at all about the East Pacific systems, and to be honest, I don't see them being a major contributor to changing the flow across the U.S. They tend to just develop, and they're running off in this direction, so that's why I've not talked too much about them, and I don't currently see them being a major threat to Hawaii either. Um, if that changes, I'll certainly let you know, but I, I'm focusing more on the systems that are impacting the U.S. in these videos. Okay, so here is the flow. Let's let this readjust. There is one tropical system here. There's Hawaii, if you're just curious where I'm still pretty far away from it. But I want you to see, here's the little wave we're keeping an eye on. And this, this is all a part of like almost one continuous area of subtropical high. And what's gonna be fascinating is to see where this subtropical high gets kind of squashed to the bottom how often it opens up into the west, and what happens to lower pressure that's gonna be developing in this area over the next 10 days or so. So to show you that, I'm gonna show you the European Ensemble. I know we're bouncing around a lot of different models, but I'm showing you the European Ensemble because I think it's got a pretty good handle on what's gonna happen with those three pieces. So through the weekend, the trough that's been plaguing the Midwest with all the severe storms moves into the Mid-Atlantic, and we're gonna see the chance for showers and storms, especially some of which could be severe, increase over the Appalachian Mountains into the Mid-Atlantic and down into parts of the Southeast. But by Saturday and Sunday, we see the ridge really um, kind of anchoring itself and, and, and establishing itself over the Four Corner States. 
So going toward Monday and Tuesday. Now, this is where things get, I think, just fascinating. Highly amplified meridional flow. Again, that term means more north-south. And this ridge, which is almost opening up and folding, is allowing for this trough to get deeper. And the ridge that's over the four corner states is connected to it. But there will be a frontal boundary that develops later this weekend that sits right in through this area. And it's along that front that you saw in the European ensemble this kind of probability of having, uh, increased probability of having wet conditions all through where I just drew those lines. That's just five days out. If we continue this out into next week, this is Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, the north kind of flow here uh, in Canada is ultimately going to determine what's going on across much of the rest of, of the lower 48. And it's the amplification of that ridge combined with the downstream deep trough and the Bering Sea trough that seems to just be keeping this west to east boundary living across this section of the United States. That's out there to the 9th, going beyond this to the 10th, 11th, and 12th. You see that that ridge I mentioned, remember I, was, I originally drew it and looked something like that? It's still kind of there, this subtropical area of higher pressure, um, you know, all the way out to the middle of the month. And so that's going to give us a very sharp contrast north to south in terms of temperatures, with the west maintaining its heat through most of all of this. Uh, but, the, uh, but, the, but the north to south temperature gradient is going to be impressive. Okay, it already is. This is uh, early this morning. We can see uh, the excessive heat watches and warnings and advisories that stretch from parts of the southern plains through the delta, mid-south, into the southeast and along the east coast. It's also back in the Pacific Northwest. We have air quality issues in this shading. Uh, of course, that fire near Loveland continuing to cause air quality issues here. And this is an excessive heat watch down in parts of Southern California and Arizona. If we go look at today's severe storm outlook, let's see if they've updated this map. They still have the remnants of what's going on right now, uh, showing up in Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Kentucky, right along the Ohio River for the risk of strong storms. There's going to be possibly two chances as the upper level low spins over this area later today. So you have the initial push this morning. The upper level low spinning over later. This is tomorrow. Again, that whole area here from the Ohio River Valley into the southeast and mid-Atlantic, watching for strong to severe storms. And this is uh, on August the 3rd. So we're going to keep an eye on a couple of different pockets right in through here. So I will go ahead and show you the NAM again. And you know that we've had um, very poor initialization of the models. This is not a fault of the modeling system. It's just a product of summer. This is what you get at this particular point of year. We have our least uh, kind of skill and accuracy in midsummer on model performance, especially when you're trying to predict convection. So already the model is behind. These have, storms have already cleared uh, much farther to these, so this is not a very good initialization. But we're going to watch a low spin, so we watch the risk of those storms, but you could see more isolated on the back side of this low later today. Meanwhile, you can see right through this line all the way back here. And you remember, okay, we kind of drew it a moment ago as that subtropical ridge, that flow around the bottom of it, or the southern side of it, is coming in this direction. So watch what's coming out of Arizona here. See how that's moving toward Nevada and California? Just fascinating to see that. And this gets us through Friday evening. A lot of storms across parts of the east here out of this, and some storms popping here in the front range of the Rocky Mountains out into the plains of Colorado and parts of New Mexico. But take a look at the backs of the southern side of this, pushing that moisture back into this part of California and Nevada. All right, that's Friday night, getting into Saturday where the model will kind of stop. That will be when you need to keep an eye on this frontal boundary, just barely showing up here. That's what we're going to watch next. Okay, I'm going to do it a little bit differently here with the uh, models. I'm going to show you their 7 and their 10-day outlooks. Normally, we just look at their 7, but uh, they, they run out longer, and I'm just, I just want to show you something. So here's the new artificial intelligence. Look at how much it has changed in its position of where that heavy precipitation is going to be. If you watched all week, it was leaving it way out here all week, and now we've got it more toward kind of Florida. Um, important to know that I have not yet really found a lot of confidence in using the artificial intelligence for pinpointing tropical systems. I believe when they start to run it in an ensemble mode and making that public, it might be a valuable addition. But look at this. From this part of you know Alberta and British Columbia through Montana, Northern Plains, Midwest, into the east, that corridor, this is the seven day, here's the 10 day AIFS. So 7 to 10. 
And if you look at the NBM 7 and show you its 10, look at the differences here. Very interesting to see what they do with those last three days when they're added on. Really cool. Now let's go to the WPC. They don't make a 10 day. So you get seven day out of the WPC, but again, look at the differences down here with this next system. But certainly the European and the GFS do. So here's the European seven day. Here's the European 10. And what I continue to see is this corridor getting wetter and wetter and the changes in the position of the tropical system. And my area of major concern, which is in through here, unless, unless the GFS is right, there's the seven day GFS, look at this, 10 day. And that's what the GFS is currently doing. The zero Z is currently doing with the, um, with the moisture from this. Now, of course, in the Western United States with the ridging that's gonna be setting up, we are gonna be watching for a lot of heat and drought. And you'll see that again in a few moments um, developing here. But let's go to the models. European on the right, GFS on the left. And as we play this forward, we've already seen through this weekend, so let's get out there. Take note, this is by um, Sunday at one o'clock. This is where the GFS is placing this tropical system and it's somewhere in here as a much weaker wave in the European. And then as we play out there toward Monday afternoon and evening, they both are anchoring the, you know, some low pressure here, see it? While the front is driven into the Midwest, there, some rain in the Canadian Prairie. Going forward though, Tuesday into Wednesday, the European loses it, but the GFS keeps a much tighter circulation here. Meanwhile, this is a part of the deeper lows we expect to form over the Hudson Bay next week, and they will leave frontal boundaries. I know the models are quite different in the position and timing, but we're going to see that all next week. And as we work our way out there to next Friday and Saturday, the operational GFS takes that system right through the gut of the Mississippi River and runs it into a frontal boundary where it will be sitting here, which actually both models have picked up on. Really a very interesting forecast. So let's look at some probabilities. This is the 10 day possibility from the European model on getting an inch. I will tell you that the GFS ensemble does not pick up on that Mississippi Valley uh, track. It's only their operational run that's doing that. But this again shows us these areas. In fact, let's step this down to the drier spots. Yeah, I should have got a new model run in there. Let's go back to the old one. Take you out to 10 days. There we are. So this is that area that I continue to be very concerned about in terms of being dry on the eastern side of the Rockies here. On the western side of the Rockies, we're talking about quite dry conditions, except for that surge of moisture that's going this direction over the next three days. But other than that, we're looking pretty dry throughout the west. So again, if we go to the who's going to be on the wetter side of it, there's this corridor. And on the drier side of it, probability of less than a tenth of an inch right in through here. So this is going to certainly be a a flashed out scenario setting up in this region unless we get a tropical system to come through here. Okay, from there, take a look at what happens by the time we get up to August 10th and 11th and 12th. That ridge I keep talking about just lives in this area and it kind of expands at times and joins with the Bermuda High, but the flow to the north of it, it's under that flow that you're gonna see your best chances for rainfall. And that's why the week two forecasts look like this from the CPC, European model, and GFS, very similar outlooks. In week two, if we just stare at one model, the, the European, very compelling view here of what the precipitation pattern is going to be during that time. So I've got to watch this carefully. That's a lot of mid-August, early to mid-August thunderstorm activity in this region. Okay, on the temperature side of it, you know we've got the excessive heat watches and warnings. Here's today's forecast high temperatures. And uh, you can already see the heat returning to the western United States. Friday, extremely hot in the Pacific Northwest, getting back into Montana. Cooler here just on the back side of this system with the cloud cover, still hot across the south. There's Saturday, 103 in Rapid City, very, very hot in the north central plains. But look at the front that's diving in here. That's Sunday into Monday and Tuesday. And as we said, there could be an up to 20 degree swing in temperatures north-south just across one or two states here as this front dives in. And that's where things look by Wednesday. So look at the relief and the temperatures coming in by the time we get into midweek next week. While all of that heat is, stayed, is kind of suppressed to the south and over toward the Appalachian Mountains and southeast, that front's really driving through in the day five through 10 really shows how much cooler than average that air could be. 
but it's all along the west, getting all the way here into uh, parts of Alaska and this section of Canada that are going to stay hot. And we see that all the way out today, 10 through 15. And the European model has kind of bought into this as well. That's day 5 through 10, and this gets out there today, 10 through 15. So very similar forecasts overall. Okay, this was the newest update we've got. Remember, toward the end of the month, we... Um, you know, we, we wait on new model runs to come out at the beginning of a month. So we, we're still reformulating some longer range ideas, but the newest ones released are from the uh, Climate Prediction Center. And they always do an update on the last day of the month of their uh, next month's forecast. So that's what you're looking at here. This is August. And a lot of this makes sense, especially the beginning of August. So the first 10, 15 days will likely look very much like this, as you just saw in the 15 day forecast. So it feels as though it's very reflective of that. I think the second half of August is going to be a bit of a wild card. We don't know at this particular point exactly where the subtropical ridging is going to live. Like right now, it's from here way out to the you know the Atlantic Ocean. Um, will it continue to stay that way? And this will ultimately be challenged by any tropical system that could come out of the Gulf of Mexico, which we know is primed for making systems later this year. So what I want to, or later this month, I wanted you to see this. Uh, but we need to uh, just remember that the picture will evolve day to day. I always, I almost always kind of complement this with the new European. But I'm going to take the European out farther. We're going to go from mid-August to mid-September. And uh, again, what we continue to see in the models is higher pressure on the northern and on the western side of the Pacific High. And the northern side of the Bermuda High continues to be stronger with lower pressure to the south. And that, that's the same narrative we've kept for a while as to what might be affecting U.S. precipitation patterns. So if I slip in there and show you the U.S., this is the mid-August to mid-September outlook. And to be honest, it's not showing any sort of a dominant signal. It, it's, it kind of left it out. Uh, so I can't look at this and say, oh, wow, the model has picked up on and, and tell you something here. Uh, it, it, it really doesn't have that dominant of a signal going forward. That's important to know. That means that means we'll likely be in a situation where, as we've been all summer, we're week to week on figuring out where the pattern's going to go. One thing I do want to just keep thinking about, though, is these ocean temperatures. While we continue to see cooler water emerging in this area, getting a true La Nina-like signal out of this is yet to happen. So what I mean by that is we've got very strong westerlies in the southern hemisphere, very strong westerlies at times in the northern hemisphere. And normally what happens as La Niñas develop is they pull the westerly wind momentum back and it's given over to the, tr um, the trade wind. That's where the, the momentum picks up. But the Southern Oscillation Index is back here. It's back negative. And what's important about that is if it's negative, that's more of an El Nino-like signal. And again, the Southern Oscillation Index, it's a pressure measurement, a difference between um, Bur uh, excuse me, uh, Darwin and Tahiti, which is over in the Pacific, of course. So we're looking at what's going on with the trade winds here. That's where we're comparing. And so this has yet to give us that full flavor of La Nina in late summer. But we can't deny that the water temperatures have cooled off here. And now they're averaging about a half degree C below normal here and much cooler the farther uh, to, the, to the east you go. But still waiting on La Nina to be a dominant factor. What I do know is that the Atlantic is warm. And if you come over here to this great graphic put out by uh, Tomer Berg, um, you know, he's got, of course, the risk area from the National Hurricane Center, but I want you to look at the color coding. So we always make a very distinct break at 26 degrees Celsius because in the very upper 70s, really the low 80s, about 81 degrees Fahrenheit, we have the ability to sustain a, a, a hurricane, a hurricane strength winds from the ocean temperatures. I want to just note how expansive that area is in the Atlantic right now. It's not that it's atypical, but this over here is. This is much warmer than average, and that's why we have such um, such an increased risk factor for whatever this is to rapidly develop in this area. So unless something else like wind shear or kind of a ruined moisture profile or a front or something that comes down here to move this, I just want to let you know that I'll be watching it carefully to see how it moves toward Florida after going over the greater Antilles. So just a note that the ocean is primed. The other part of this is in this temperature figure. I made a kind of a, a discussion about this yesterday. This cool right in through here, just along the Sahel, this is very, very telling of where the deep convection is in this area. And it tells me that Africa is, is sending off easterly waves. They've been dealing with a lot of dust here lately, but this will continue to push systems 
and develop them as we now get into August, which is really the beginning of the height of the hurricane season. So from now for the next 45 days, we are going to be historically pushing toward the peak of the hurricane season. And then we have 45 days after that where it winds down. So there's 90 days of hurricane season ahead of us. But you've been looking here at global temperatures over the next 10 days. Here's global precipitation. A couple of important things. Models are forecasting better rains in Ukraine. Watch that carefully. Very wet conditions throughout northern India, from uh, especially through the Ganges River Valley on this big surge. We have a couple of tropical systems we're watching. Dry in Southeast Asia, but very wet across the kind of the northern growing areas like the North China Plain, Manchurian Plain, parts of the Shandong province. So this is key. Outside of that, still wet in southern Brazil, but the dry season is still very much on in central Brazil. But we're about a month away before a lot of folks here start trying to put some seed in the ground. They're going to wait on the monsoonal cir uh, circulation to set up, but we're going to be already talking uh, in one month about the uh, South American growing season. Okay, I'm going to stop it here, and tomorrow we'll give you more of a summary on July, and we'll just keep watching these trends in the models and see what we find. So I appreciate your attention, and we'll talk tomorrow. Thanks.